I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order, 602. Um, and I have one agenda item to add, and that's going to be under the um, board education, and it's just a quick update. I sent, there's one spot over there, Megan. Uh, I sent you all an email or yeah an email with um, the the change it's in our board procedures and um, Linda you all should be able to co she um, copied it and she three hole punched it so you can take in your binder you can take out the page and while I was doing it, I fixed the letters. <laughs> I think it was you pointed out, oops, the letter was after all that alphabetizing in elementary school and I still messed it up. Anyway, um, so uh, I just want to draw your attention to it. So I'm adding that under board education. Um, that'll take like one minute. Um, so the rest of the meeting will will be um, looking at ownership linkage planning um, and getting a report on that committee uh, meeting and then um, the the other majority of the meeting will be on financial planning and budgeting in relation to the ends accomplishment and um, preparing the budget um, so uh, any questions on sort of the agenda as we get going okay um, so moving along we're going to start with public comment as always and um, again I'm going to start with just our preamble for how our public comment will take place so the board welcomes comments but is not able to take any action on them other than to direct the public to the appropriate staff member or to the complaint procedure. Comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. Time may not be ceded to another speaker. Right. Comments are to be addressed to me, the board chair, or the board as a whole, not to any individual on the board, on the staff, or in the public. Please raise your hand and wait to speak until you are asked to by me. Please identify yourself with your first and last name and your town of residence. Please refrain from restating comments that have already been shared. You can express agreement with those comments. Order and decorum shall be observed by everyone. Shouting and profanity are prohibited. As the board chair, I will maintain the order and decorum of the meeting. So I'm going to open it up now to public comments. Looks like we have one person there. Those of you who might be online, please raise your hand using the little icon on the bottom if you would like to speak. And since we have someone here in person and you've raised your hand. Hi, uh, John Helfand, parent of three OSSD students. Uh, the uh, portrait of the graduate or ownership subcommittee meeting that I attended, uh, there's little talk of parents and stakeholders. And I think actually they need to be the main stakeholders in that discussion. There are children, we brought them up. When they leave the school system, they'll still be our children. We'll still be raising them in their 20s and until they go on with life. Um, even when they get older, they're gonna turn to us. So I think we have the main responsibility to be stakeholders in that conversation. Uh, there was talk of students and teachers and uh, board members and um, uh, Battelle for Kids and local business owners. Uh, I think local business owners would be important, as would parents. We've been in the workforce. We know what's needed from graduates, from people we want to hire in the future. Um, so I, I think that's really important. I heard a lot of talk about students. They should have input. But I would like to point out they haven't graduated yet. They haven't been in full -time, uh, the full-time workforce. I don't think they really comprehend exactly what's needed yet. Um, so their input would be great, but I, I think the people that have already been out in the workforce should really have uh, the main talk on that. Patel for Kids is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, um, organization, uh, foundation, and uh, I don't think we need a globalist uh, funded organization uh, interfering with 
our local decisions for our children. Uh, I would not use them. I think parents and local, um, local business owners can guide our children better. Enough on that topic. I'd like to talk about Lane's comments in the recent uh, RTCC video. His uh, quote is, this is tied to their religious belief systems and hatred and bigotry is tied to belief systems. I think that was highly inappropriate. There's probably people here sitting at this table that are part of a belief system that actually concur with the gender identity policies of the school system. And to lump everybody together is, is, um, is a horrible thing for, for him to do. Uh, as an executive, myself and my profession, I would never think of uh, classifying a group of people with the terms hatred and bigotry. It would get me fired. And I think the board should sanction him for that, and I don't think they should renew his contract when it comes up. It's just another example of the divisiveness he's caused in our community, and he's used the same words in front porch forum and uh, in his open forums. And I, I don't think it's acceptable. We need somebody different. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have anybody else online? Doesn't look like it. Okay. So moving on, um, I'm just going to start with um, this addition to our um, procedures so you can replace this. I think it's the fifth page in, in our procedures. There's just one um, little change on the committees. So again, uh, just to help people remember um, with the committees, um, open meeting law requires that committee meetings be um, open to the public. That means we have to have public comment at the beginning of them. It means that, that they need to be warned um, 48 hours in advance. If possible, it means we need to take minutes. Um, however, um, you know, committees tend to be, you know, for four or five meetings and then they're over. So that final meeting, <laughs> that's where um, when I was talking with the legal counsel through the VSBA, um, she redirected me to this um, Secretary of State's office to their um, legal person because there's actually in the law, there's nothing that says minutes have to be approved. Um, so, but um, so what I did is I, she basically said what you could do is just, um, if, it's a, if it's a committee that's meeting several times, you know, to review the minutes at the beginning of the meeting and approve them, kind of gets everybody in the mindset of, oh yeah, what did we do last time? And, and that's fine, but at your, the final minutes from the last time that that committee is gonna meet, you will just send them in to Linda. She'll post them. They'll be draft minutes. They just stay available to the public for around a year. So I put that information under H, the committees, and it's section D, um, just so that everybody knows um, because we are doing a little bit of our work um, as committees. Any questions on that? No. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so you can pull out that other page and, and replace it. So we've got the right information. Um, so next up, um, and I apologize, <laughs> I realized that I hadn't sent out the um, letter, the first draft that Ben had put together. Um, so Ben does the sort of the public relations um, writing for the district. So uh, and I apologize, Sarah, because when I was reviewing the minutes, I realized you were on that committee and Chelsea and I forgot and we met with Ben oh, okay. and we had the meeting. Um, and sorry, I missed it. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Um, so Ben put together a draft. Um, and uh, basically this is just the letter that goes out with the, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a glossy brochure that goes out to all the voters with the, 
with the budget information, there are um, letters from the principals, there's a letter from Lane, there's a letter from the board. Um, and so Chelsea and I met with Ben. We went over sort of, you know, what things the board had been up to. This is what he drafted. Um, so if hopefully you've had a chance to read it. We're basically, um, he has to, the board has to approve the letter at our January meeting. So between now and then, if you read through it and you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, there's this huge error in it or, or um, you see something that um, really needs to be in there, um, please let me know um, and, and we'll make changes. Uh, so, so that's that. Um, and at our next meeting, we'll be um, approving that letter. Um, or it's, it's called the message to voters. Um, so that's that. Any questions on that? So you all and you all have a meet uh, uh, an email from me with it attached. I made a mistake. <laughs> I attached the minutes from the meeting the first time around. Thank you, Katja, for catching that. So um, the letter is uh, attached at the second email. Um, so just let me know if you've got any question, any edits. You can also let Chelsea or Sarah know. Okay. Um, so next up is just reviewing the um, who's up for election. Um, so Katja. Um, Hannah, Sam, uh, you are all up for election if you want to continue with the board. Um, and uh, so in order to do that, you have to get signatures. And it varies from town to town, I believe. Linda, do you know the specifics? Like I know Randolph, it's most is maybe 30, 30 for Randolph. It's I don't. 11 for Brooks. Yeah. 11? <laughs> oh! I think it's 11 for Brooks. Yeah, 11 or yeah. 12. Yeah, you guys are and lucky. It's, like, it's only 5%, I think, of the vote registered yeah. voters. Right. Yeah. And then during COVID, they didn't even do that. Right. So I mean, yeah. I yeah. assume they're back to that. They are, sure. yeah, they do yeah. need to complete a petition. Yeah. 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 The due date is January, what, 24th? Uh, it's the. September days before. Yeah, yeah. it's like. Yeah. The, I have to post it by, I think, Jan my first day is January 26th. So, yeah, we'd have to have it certainly a day or yeah, two before Yeah, I would that. check with your town clerk just <coughs> to make sure you know the exact, because um, I think it's like a week before yeah, town we meeting have to get or two weeks the, before yeah. town meeting. I forget the exact time frame. But, um, do you have that information, Linda? in the have, office i know um not for petitions because i don't no. know what they okay do. That's how about um posting when? your warnings is between 30 and 40 days before the vote okay. so you can't post them before 40 days so it's okay. like january 26 i think until february 5th is okay. my window to post morning the all morning. right if any of you <coughs> three have to have any questions or need help finding that information let me know uh, but just be aware it is a little bit ahead of, I think it's toward the, and it is definitely toward the end of January, so. Christmas parties. <laughs> you want to well, you, I mean, <laughs> usually you don't have to, it's usually kept in the office of the town. The. It wasn't. Oh, really? really? It was for us. That's <laughs> just. Oh, yeah. Oh, and people are very kind. Oh, um, yeah. I, I, I canvassed my neighborhood, and that was how I did it. But anyway, um, all right, so folks know that information. Um, so next up was uh, the complaint procedure. We just had, um, the board had, had um, asked me to just review with the lawyer the, just the very last section of that complaint procedure. Again, just to really clarify 
kind of what the board is doing in that. And that was, did we, did you, you attach that, right? It's the second page. It's the second page? Yeah. Okay, there it is. Yep, second page. Um, so are there any questions on that? And this came right from Sean. He kind of helped me put it in there. Does it, does, are, are folks feeling um, good about that? Step the, seven. I can't remember what was just the board makes a decision. On numbers, that was the last step part. seven. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So we just went we're back and we kind like of the we're review. actually making. Right. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's more in in line with what we have on step five on the first page. Yeah, and we basically just reiterated it on step seven on the second page. So we need a motion to move to approve? To approve, okay. but. I'll, I'll move to approve um, the OSSD board procedure for hearing complaints as written and reviewed by the lawyer. Excuse me, any discussion? We got all, it. Of, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Um, there we go. Um, so the ownership linkage plan committee met, um, and I'm going to have um, Katja sort of do a report out on what happened. Um, okay. uh, we met um, virtually, feels like a long time ago, but it was just on the 30th, it looks like. Um, just to discuss, it was kind of just a planning meeting, the first time of us gathering together to just see what this was going to potentially look like, um, to come together with some ideas, especially focusing on the, you know, desire really to have this more in the community's hands as far as getting, gaining that input um, and really having that involvement from our community members um, about what this looks like. So, uh, came up with a lot of um, the idea of really having these dinners, um, potential dinners where we have communities come, members come together, we start discussing and brainstorming. We can kind of come up with these things all together of what the idea of our portrait of a graduate looks like, you know, what that student looks like when they've graduated through the OSSD. And then there was some discussion of how this would be kind of structured from a facilitator standpoint. Um, so Heather did bring in some ideas regarding this, I'm not going to know the, say the name correctly, the TEL organization um, that does facilitate um, these types of gatherings and, and coming up with a portrait of a graduate. So we also talked about the importance of really getting this work done, hopefully, within the school year. So having a document that we can kind of present um, to the community after all that community involvement um, in June <coughs> and the end of the year end of the school year. Um, I think we all kind of agreed that, you know, the, again, like I said, that, that should be taking place in the public. And so having committee meetings and having, you know, we just need to kind of go out there and start this work. Um, so hoping to kind of kick it off in January, which is very soon, um, and seeing how we can get that done. So there were a number of us also present. So I don't know if Hannah or Megan or Anne or Heather want to share any other insights from it? Um, I, I was there. Did we? <laughs> and now I'm thinking, did we, did we set the, we didn't set a date, any date, so not. how are we going to do that? Did we discussed we, that we would consider a date uh, in either late January or early February. Okay. And so I reached out to Sarah Natvig to discuss um, the creation of a base meal. We had, you had brought up the concept of using some discretionary board funds mm -hmm. to fund um, either one or more of these community dinners to provide a base meal and invite people to also bring a potluck item if they so, if it's, they're able or interested in doing so. So you might want to consider, I don't know if it's appropriate, but to move for discretionary funds to be allocated for that purpose so that we could, we could move forward. We have not booked a date for it yet. That is true. Okay. Um. 
Was Sarah able to give any sort of like rough idea of? She was like, I'll absolutely do it. <laughs> like a budget, like what she's looking at. Oh, it'd be like. about uh, probably if we anticipate a hundred people, however many people mm -hmm. we anticipate, um, she could do a full meal for under ten dollars per person. Have you? I'm sorry, is it okay to yeah, ask absolutely. questions? Yeah, um, absolutely. Have you done any type of um, surveying to see how many people would be interested and so, would be attending this? Um, as far as planning, you know, I'm thinking if you're going to have like some type of catering or food provided so we don't have too much or too little. Exactly. So what mm -hmm. I, uh, so I reached out to the principals to ask if they would estimate based on what they, their current turnouts for their home community events. Mm -hmm. But the feedback I got was that would not be an accurate representation because people have a different feeling about coming to their home elementary school right, or their, their child's current school, mm -hmm. then possibly going to another location for an all-community event. So what we've decided to do is that once we pick a date, to mm -hmm. ask people to pre-register. Quick little survey, we're coming, this is how many people, so that we have an estimated count. Mm -hmm. and, well, and I think that brings up an interesting idea that if we're going to be doing a number of these, it might be worthwhile doing them in different locations. Definitely. Yeah, so that, that those, yeah, yes. like doing one in Randolph, one in Brookfield, one in Braintree, and then maybe a, the a fourth one back in Randolph again. Mm -hmm. But that we can give um, everyone a chance to feel comfortable to um, definitely come to it. And we also, will we be targeting to make sure we get a diversity of, of voices as well a little bit, or are we just going to? You know, it seems to me sometimes if you don't reach out to some folks, they might not show up, and yet their viewpoint and their experience might be important to hear. Um, right, so. We, yeah, we need to reach out beyond the school community. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. but of course that will go out, but from Porch Forum, the paper, even. And I spoke with uh, Lance Matzi, who's our video uh, instructor about the creation of a marketing video. Milton recently uh, started some equity work and they made such a wonderful video um, that really invited the community in. It made it sound like it was gonna be such a fun night. You know, we're gonna eat together, we're gonna talk together. And so I showed that Milton video to Lance and I said, help, can you help us make something this wonderful? And he's like, yeah, piece of cake. So we will use Front Porch Forum, but we'll also use our students to, um, in this, Votech program to help us create some marketing. And uh, I think I think that pretty much wraps up the meeting. We, we emphasized the importance of student and parent involvement, and we talked also about the importance of including business owners and other taxpayers. If I may, I think it's important we find a date like today. <laughs> I mean, people need to plan out, right? Mm -hmm. And we need time to plan how it's going to work. If we're thinking January, we don't it's meet January. again until January. <laughs> right, um, right. But we need to nail it down. And the, the semester ends right around Martin Luther King Day, right, usually? So it might be, that might be a nice time to do it right after the semester ends, just because mm -hmm. everybody's sort of calming down and we're, you're starting kind of a new, a new, hmm? Yes. Yeah, I was thinking more of the high school. Um, well, have you considered maybe rather than holding like maybe the first one holding it at the high school that's kind of more of a draw to people where it's not people from every town coming you know it seems like more of a I don't know what's the word I'm looking for everybody shares, everybody shares the high school. yes yeah mm -hmm. a shared mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. rather than one of the elementary schools I think it would be good to start here and then you know, like start in Randolph, move out to those ones, and then mm -hmm. come back in Randolph. But um, when in Randolph being the high school. Yeah, 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 yeah. elementary yeah. school. Yeah. Okay. About Thursday, February 2nd.
Is it? Does it matter? Is it Groundhog Day? Does it matter? I mean, I guess over and over. That is really important. Questions would be though is um, because it sounds like whether or not we're going to facilitate this ourselves in district or have an organization facilitate for us. Would we would we have that answer by February second? We have another meeting in January, so if we need to make any decisions. Well, if if it's something that we can we can set a date and ask them if they can't do it, then they could come to the next one. But that could be like the introduction. Like these are the people that are coming to the next meeting. We wanted to introduce everyone to what we're doing. They're going to come and facilitate this. That's kind of like the backup plan if they couldn't come. And remember, we've authorized Heather to get this moving mm -hmm. yeah. to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. So even if the committee isn't meeting, she can be doing some of the behind yeah. the scenes organizing as she already has and reaching out to Sarah and mm -hmm. kind of facilitating getting things rolling. Um, so I think, because if we delay too much, it's just... No, I agree. We need to start moving on. Not, uh, in, in February, we're already in February. <laughs> well, I just so, wanted to. But yeah, that, I mean, that gives you enough time, and it gives. The, like you can only the, ring a bell once. Right. So <laughs> I'd like, I'd like, or the first time. Right. 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 So you want it, so you I'd like the have launch the to be a really good feeling thing. So I, that's why I put, right. I, yeah, I, I yeah, propose yeah. that date. What totally was it? February second. Could I propose it as a tentative date? Yeah. yeah. And to, then subsequently to Thursday. secure. Thursday. I need to. I want to check with the building principals to make sure the calendar is clear mm -hmm. and uh, to make sure that I'm not stepping on any community events that are already in place. Yeah. But I'll put it as a tentative date. Um, How about we? we well, you, we've already charged you to go ahead and get things going, so you could also just sort of float some dates to us. You know, okay. So, got it. Go ahead and get some. calendar is clear and mid to announce it so we can start talking right. about it right yes and then we'll we have that to... January we'll have a January um, midi meeting probably right oh will we we can I, I'm thinking we... oh yeah we can do <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this is the proposal from the person to facilitate so that so would be January. a topic for a subcommittee meeting. Okay. Yeah. So we should plan on having one in January. Then. Yeah. I can send out a Google call. Thank you. Okay. I felt all we have. Any other questions from the board? Okay. All right. Moving on. Awesome. So we are we are moving forward on that. Front. Um, okay, so next up is just the first review of the financial planning and budgeting monitoring report, um, which is nice because it's right in line with the time where um, we're going to be looking at the budgeting for next this next year, um, as well as the emergency superintendent succession. And that's where it's kind of nice that we have an assistant superintendent. So hopefully the training is taking place there too. So uh, makes that a little um, less urgent to make sure for sure we've got somebody there. Um, because before it was bringing up a principal and this time we've got an ass assistant superintendent. So Lane, you want to tell us a little bit about those? Again, um, Sam, you're new, so the first time we get these monitoring reports, he just sort of explains what he's, what he's done, and then during this next month, you can go down in his office. He has some binders that um, have any supporting documents that he might not, because he can't put everything in, um, that you can go and take a look at. Um, and if you have any questions about the report, you can always set up a time to just come in and 
ask him a few questions if you don't understand what's what's going on, as well as of me and any of the other board members. Yeah. And then they'll they'll do a second read, and that's where you know there's any kind of final <coughs> questions and approve or or deny. Um, so in bo both cases, both are in compliance. Um, policy 2.4, the financial planning and budgeting, um, is really. If I were to sum it up, it's about two things. It's making sure that we're following, fi uh, you know, normal financial procedures, accepted financial procedures as we go about our work. Um, the bigger part of it, though, um, kind of connects back with budgeting um, and making sure, because remember, when we're planning our budget, it's for a year in, a year in advance, right? So what we're planning now affects the next school year. It doesn't affect this right now. So it's making sure that the data that we use as we do those budget production, uh, projections is credible. All right, it's coming from good sources. It makes sense. It's reasonable. And so, um, so some of the evidence that was put in there um, was to try to show a little bit of what we examined. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any specific questions on either one. And again, this is a, your first, first mm -hmm. sort of go around with it. Um, this was a longer one in terms of writing, so I apologize for that. Some of them are short, some of them are long. Uh, and the second one, the emergency superintendent succession, was, did you change it up a little bit now that you have, you yeah. have the yeah. assistant superintendent? Yeah, there's... Um, with the addition of the assistant superintendent, so we talked a little bit about that, and I also just to make sure that it was documented someplace in case I'm I'm incapacitated directly within the report is the procedure, the process the board would follow um, mm -hmm. to kind of make that that transition Excellent. and who to contact and whatnot. So again, all board members, you want to review those and ask Lane any questions, go into the, oh, and remember, the central office is now somewhere up here, right? Oh, over there. The old faculty <laughs> room, and then uh, Heather and I are actually in the front office here, okay. at least for the next okay. month and a half until they get the yeah. repairs done. It's okay. very festive in there. <laughs> it's a different sound type going on, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually really nice. Well, it's, yeah. We're laughing. It was, I don't know if you've had one yet. The, the kids, that's where they used to use it as kind of the reset room, the timeout room. So I'll be sitting in there doing my work, and a little kid will come in and just sit down and won't say a word. <laughs> uh, uh, it's happened like three times. It's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> Like, it's a shock to see you. Yep. <laughs> Wait, what did he do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you reset me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really cute. I got in trouble because uh, one of the one of the kids was um, running away from the school. They had to go out and catch the poor little bugger, and she came in, and of course. I usually work with a high schooler, so I'm not thinking too much about the elementaries and the abstract thought piece. So I said, no, next time run faster. Because <laughs> they caught her. And, you know, of course, she didn't get that it was a joke, so then I had to explain it. But <laughs> It's been fun. <laughs> okay. So next up is the um, facilities report. Uh, yeah, the, unless, unless there's specific questions, the two big things there, obviously, are the heat. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I think I put it in the superintendent's report, but the overall cost so far is about 285000 um, is where it's coming in at. Um, talked a little bit about it in the superintendent's report um, to try to give an explanation of you know, what happened, why it took so long to get things done. Um, but as they were doing the work, they obviously uncovered other problems. Mm -hmm. um, there is the, the electrical um, conduit that, that carries electricity and the control systems and the wires for that uh, out to the little shed where the, the heating boilers are housed. Um, those were in a steel conduit, which is corroded away, so that wow. system needs to be replaced. Um, those boilers also heat the domestic hot water for the building. And um, they used, for whatever reason, the same iron pipe um, at that point in time. And so those have corroded enough. They haven't failed, but they're bad enough. And since we're in there anyway, we're going to have them do that, that work and that replacement. 
Um, we did put in for a reserve uh, request, a facilities reserve request for about another 150,000, which we're hoping covers uh, the remainder. So that work, um, as well as the resurfacing, right? They had to rip up quite a bit of asphalt and part of the foundations of both buildings to do the work. Um, so you know you're looking looking at about what 450,000 in total by the time that this is done. We have worked closely with um, the insurance company to see what they can do. There's not much they're willing um, to step into to help us with um, in oh, terms of this. It's, it's 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 old. It was you know it was a catastrophic. Failure. I was hoping that we'd be able to at least get some money for the emergency stuff that we had to pull in to keep the building safe. And so we're still working on that a little bit with them. But, um, but it, it's, it's up, it's running incredibly well. Um, the facilities team itself, uh, I cannot understate the gratitude um, to them. Uh, they work around the clock. Um, I think I kind of had mentioned this, there were about almost a dozen different vendors that literally dropped everything they were doing and made this their priority. Um, so they, they're gonna need to be thanked. We're planning on getting a full page spread in the, in the local paper for that. Um, and then the other folks that need to be thanked are all the ones that were waiting on the contractors to come and do the works in their homes that were um, willing to give up uh, their work and wait a little bit so that this could get wow. done. So it was, a, it was a real community kind of pulling together event. Um, the other big kind of project that's going on, um, and there may be a reserve fund request for this, um, is... Uh, the central office is undergoing repair and renovation um, as part of the work when the structural engineer came in um, there was very deep concern about the supports in the basement that hold the building up um, in terms of a catastrophic failure so it won't be anywhere near as expensive as the work that's happening on the building itself but it'll probably be in the $10,000 range to have them come in and shore that up the way that it needs to be and to do it properly. Um, so it was actually good that we're doing the work because they came in and checked on that. Um, mm -hmm. They are moving forward with the locker room work. Um, that is being done by the same company that is doing the repairs on the central office. So they'll be doing it at the same time. Um, projection for being done is hopefully after they get started on or about the 15th of December. Um, six to eight weeks. So, uh, so things are moving started yet. Uh, there's a lot of planning. Uh, oh, they have okay. to get the forms. They have to have the fire marshal come in and look at things, uh, and and so that actually takes longer than the darn construction right. <laughs> itself. And then we're keeping our fingers crossed. The the um, supply chain issues seem to be clearing up across the country right now. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully the materials will be coming in. But yeah. But again, there are the the nine other spaces in the building. Um, that folks can use for privacy that have always been there. Yeah. I have a question. Um, who ever, um, do you know who originally installed those heating pipes and can they be held accountable for so failing? It was about 20 years ago. Um, it may or may not have been chip tech. So how all this work came about and why those boilers aren't physically in the high school where they should be um, was because, and you may have been around long enough to remember this, um, they received a grant, is my understanding, to put in a, a wood chip boiler. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they built that little building out back, um, built the wood chip boiler in there to actually heat the water that goes through the buildings and heats the buildings. Um, and at the same time, for whatever reason, they decided um, to move the, the two boilers out of the building and put them in the same location, um, which actually caused us some problems that I described uh, in, in the, the support piece. And it was at that time that they ran those, those pipes and stuff. We did do a little bit of research, you know, why wasn't it PVC, you know, plastics and cast iron and things are the standards that aren't going to get eaten up by the road salt. Mm -hmm. um, it was the time that it was built was within a year or two of when they were transferring to that new standard. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. Why they put in steel in an area there where road salt is going to be encroaching on it, I have no idea. That made no sense to me mm -hmm. um, at the time. And what complicated things considerably was it was a specialty company. It was a startup. There were a lot of startups around that time for, mm -hmm. for wood chip um, boiler for re renewable energies. 
and um, the company went out of business shortly thereafter, and so they used all their own specialty parts on everything, which uh. is why we couldn't <laughs> get our hands on what we needed. Oh, okay, um, that makes sense. Yeah, we, we lucked out um, in that uh, the first company was actually going to get them manufactured. Another contractor was able to get connected with a company, I believe, that was in China. They had parts that didn't quite fit the bill, but that this company had the knowledge, manpower, and equipment to actually adapt um, to make it fit and work, and that's how they were able to speed it up. And again, that was due to the, the work of the facilities team. Um, but I don't think we can go back. There was also some failures in terms of maintenance over, over the years. Um, the two new co-facilities directors, um, they actually started a month or two into my tenure. Um, and they picked up on the fact um, that first year that the water chemistry was not being maintained. Mm -hmm. It's a closed loop system with hot water in it. Um, and usually that water is treated to prevent two things, um, prevent scale from building up and clogging up the pipes and or um, keeping the pipes from being corroded because with hot water, the chemical reactions are gonna happen two or three times faster than you know at normal temperatures. And so we don't know how many years that was not being done, but they did start doing that water chemistry work immediately when they picked up on it. Mm -hmm. um, so that may have contributed. So some of it may have been our own fault. Um, okay. Yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah, a lot more than you wanted probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was helpful for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions, facilities, or the facilities report? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move us along here. Um, so, they can make the transition. so next, it's you again, Lane, on kind of take, giving us an overview of how the budgeting is looking for this year. This is actually going to be a fun presentation if I can get it up. <laughs> because um, it's going to scare the crap out of you up front, and then it actually works out really well in the end. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but give me a second. I've got a. I'm going to see if I can actually get it on the screen. So okay. So maybe we, can, if we want, we can take a five-minute recess, and yep. people can use the bathroom, or they can just stand up. Glass of water. Let's see if I can do this without setting off all sorts of feedback. Uh -oh. It's all right. Uh, yeah. It's actually not as clean here as I thought. No, I know. I brought, I brought my suit down. Yeah, I, I doubled up with a long sleeve and a sweater. Well, I was at Twin Fields High School working today. And I was, they, they put me in this conference room that was really cold, so I was cold all the time. Oh, it's hard to get back from that, too. Right, right, right. Well, I came home and I just kind of sat in front of the fire and kind of reviewed some stuff. Yeah. There we go. Looks like it's up. Right, so yes. Oh. I know. Oh. I'm too. I am really psyched. Oh. Oh. <laughs> How'd the, how the kiddos do? Did they get really asleep before they got home last night? They were so she's fading. hungry. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. It looked like they're having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Looks like Kelsey's still, still not, not back. <laughs> well, that's I did say five minutes, and I didn't check the time. Oh, dear. That's me in time. So, and a lot of this is... Um, 
Oh, here she is. It's not, not just to communicate to the board. Um, there'll be a number of forums and um, conversations okay. with the community about this, especially as we get more and more of the formulas and data that we still need to really kind of complete the process from the state. Uh, we actually have quite a bit of it now. And so I'll, I'll put that caution out there that, you know, this is the best data that we have at, at the time. It is definitely well within the ballpark, but it, but it may not be exact. Um, so a couple of things about the budget process and, and, and what we've been striving for over the, the last couple of years. We're getting closer, but we're not quite there yet. But it will happen as time goes on. And that's the idea that we start off um, at the top which is actually the board, right? You have your, your mission statement that's, that's codified in the ends. Um, and what we've done over the last year or so is we have created an evaluation system for the staff where they literally take the ends and they break them down into the personal goals that they will be working on for the year that support the ends. And then they communicate back to the administrative team, hey, these are the goals I'm working on. This is in support of the math end. This is, this is how it is. This is the data I'm using to measure whether I'm being successful or not. If I'm going to do this effectively, this is what I need in terms of resources. So it is one of the primary drivers behind um, a lot of the budget, right? Because the budget is our main tool for doing the work of the district, and in this case, the work of the ends. So kind of, you know, we're a little, actually we're, we're late in the season, but we're early in terms of the, all the data and the formulas that we need um, to be able to kind of complete the budget in, in totality. So the things that we're still kind of missing at this point in time is the impact of the negotiations with both the, the teachers and the staff unions. Um, and those impacts can be significant, right? If they were, if they were getting no raises for, for next year, they'd still get their step raises. And so uh, the budget would probably go up by, you know, 300000 just on that alone. Um, in terms of the potential asking where they are now, you're anywhere from 300000 to $1.4 million. Um, in terms of those negotiations. Uh, the other question that we have is the state has a large surplus, about $64 million. Um, and the question is, is will they keep that all connected to the Ed Fund or will they do something else with it? They, the recommendation in the December 1st letter, which comes out, was that it should all go into supporting the Education Fund. So this particular budget, is based upon the fact that they will be putting that $64 million, um, into the Ed Fund. Um, the other piece that we still are waiting for finalization on um, is our surplus from last year. We had a significant surplus. Um, we usually do a couple of things with that money. Um, some of it we typically roll over into the next year to subsidize next year's taxes, um, to bring taxes down for folks. And some of it we ask the voters to put into various reserve funds um, to help us out with big projects when they come um, so that we don't have to go out to bond. Um, the auditors have to finalize that, and so when they give us that number, you know, that'll be the next thing that we're kind of talking about is what do we want to do or what should we be doing with this money. Um, statewide, the expectation is that uh, education budgets will increase by a minimum of 8.5%. That's due to inflation, that's due to all the other factors that have been happening in the, the economy over the last year or two as we come out of a COVID pandemic. Um, I'll give you the good news. Um, so revenue considerations, so these are additional funds that we are expecting. Um, remember that uh, we are transitioning um, in terms of how we fund special education. Uh, in the older days, it was a reimbursement model. We'd have kids, we'd serve them, and then we would send a bill to the state for a portion of, of that money, and they would provide that back to us. And that was great because if we had several kids move in in the middle of the year after our budget was already set, right, um, we would be guaranteed that we would have the funding to supply their needs. They have shifted to a block grant model, um, and they've done some kind of manipulations around, you know, who gets, you know, what amount based upon the, the, the population of students that they have. And so based upon this transition to the block grant model, we are up uh, $234,000 that we did not expect in terms of previous years. It compensates us for the $200,000 hit we took last year um, in the first year of the transition. Um, the big one is that the property yield is up by over $2,000. 
Um, so that means the equalized pupil money that we will be receiving is going to increase by 1.7 million. Um, and so that's a very good thing. Um, we also do a very good job of attracting students to the district. Um, last year we received $465,000 in money for students who tuitioned in to be a part of our district. Um, that has been consistently rising. Um, it may drop a little next year from this number. We've had a lot of LGBTQ students who are moving out of the district right now, um, given the controversies that have been happening. Um, we also, if folks remember, um, three years ago, when I was concerned about what might happen to the economy across the country and didn't know what impact that was going to have on the Ed Fund, I started putting surplus money away to be able to subsidize future budgets, um, right, put money in so that taxpayers didn't have to pay as much. Um, that money was promised, they voted on it, um, and so there is $746,503 um, that will help to subsidize this budget. Um, this coming year. On the expense side, you know, additional it, things that we're looking to have to pay above and beyond what we are doing currently this year. Um, and a lot of these are tied directly to the ends. We have the Carnegie Math program that was brought in, has been in place for a couple of years. The teachers are getting training on it each year um, to try to expand their skill with that. Um, running those programs costs money to keep up on the consumables that go along with it as well as the software packages, it's $37,000 a year. Um, it sounds like a lot, it's not, that is typical. Um, one of the reasons why it's kind of an addition for us is because for many years we did not have textbooks and materials. Um, and so we are trying to reverse that trend, it's very hard to educate kids well without those materials. Um, we are adding a little bit more to our robotics program. Um, that $13,600 um, supports both the robotics program that exists within the classes that students can take at RUHS um, and as well as an after school program. So a lot of it is, um, you know, we, we've actually probably pumped about $450,000 into that program over the course of the last three or four years. Um, this is for replacement parts. They've got most of the equipment they need and for um, travel to be able to go to the competitions. Um, we have brought in a well-researched set of programs to improve literacy um, for our students. Um, so kind of like the Carnegie Math, um, these are the materials in the books um, and the software packages needed to improve uh, the student literacy. And so this is for English language arts. It's uh, the programs are geodes, wit and wisdom, and foundations. Um, Project Lead the Way is um, a, a piece that Heather has brought up. Um, this falls under kind of the critical thinking, um, the science foundational standard. It's kind of a pre-engineering um, STEM sort of program that will be very, very good for students. Um, we are purchasing materials for the LEAD curriculum um, for the health instructors. Um, this falls under kind of the life skills um, portion of, of the board's ends. Um, we have two curriculum directors. We have one that is overseeing K-12 math and one that is overseeing K-12 ELA. Um, they have traditionally been on a teacher style contract where they're only here, you know, the 185 days that the teachers are. But there is a lot of planning, especially with these new materials that are coming in um, that they need to do. So this is to pay them to come in for a couple extra weeks over the summer uh, and get that planning done um, to take a look at the data, assessment data that is supposed to be coming out around those times um, and to start to use it to do an analysis to say, hey, you know, on those first days of school when we have professional development with the teachers, this is where we week, this is what we need to work on and, and let's get together and figure out how we're going to make this better. Um, and so that's what that money is for. Um, as part of kind of supporting all teachers to make sure that they can effectively deliver on the ends, uh, we started a, what's called a boot camp program about three years ago, um, which we've expanded. All the new teachers come in for a week um, and get training in who we are, what we do, all the initiatives like Carnegie and robotics and geodes and wit and wisdom so that on the first day of school they can hit the ground running competently uh, with those programs with the students. 
Um, in terms of transportation, uh, the costs are just going up. Um, and so that's why, why those are there. So these are kind of the general expenses. Um, in terms of preschool, uh, we are looking for a 1-0 para uh, at Brookfield. Um, remember going back a few years, what the district did is uh, we recognized that if we were going to improve student outcomes, the best place to start was with the youngest students um, to give them those pre-skills that are going to help them really succeed when they get into the elementary grades to help them with their socialization skills as well as to early identify any learning disabilities that they may have so that we can address them early uh, before they magnify over time. Um, a lot of the preschool program was originally built using grant money and what we have slowly been doing is as the grant money is drying up is we are transferring those people over to the regular budget to make it um, you know, a permanent program. So we do, we have full day free kindergarten for all four year olds and Pat has been doing a wonderful job expanding the hours for our three year olds now as well. So our students are literally getting a whole extra year of education um, and a little bit more than that um, in terms of the three-year-olds. And uh, enrollments are interesting. They, um, they dropped when COVID hit because people were afraid to have their students here. They homeschooled them. But it's been slowly rising and it's almost back to you know, the, the, the high number that we had prior to COVID. Uh, Is there a waiting list? Do you know? Uh, we've been able to pretty much meet. Accommodate. We actually have, um, it's either one or two. We have one, one student that we are paying to attend a different in a di uh, preschool in a different district. We have two that are actually coming in from other districts. So, you know, we, we've, we're at the point where we were at capacity. I think there's about 74 students in there, which is bigger than a normal, mm -hmm. you know, grade of students that we have. So it's been really good. Um, Braintree, um, one of the things that we've been trying to do, and you'll see this at Brookfield as well, is uh, we started off a few years back where our librarians uh, were one, one day a week. Um, we tried to get them to two days a week, now I'm trying to get them to three days a week. Um, why? Well, it has to do with preparation time for the teachers. Um, at the high school, there's actually plenty of prep time, right? It's a seven it's a schedule that allows for seven classes, they teach five, so they've got two periods off. They, in some cases there's duties, but in other cases it's prep time. Elementary teachers don't get that. And so I was trying to honor you know, their request for, for that prep time as best I can, and this is the best way I can do it. As we build in more time for the librarians, as the kids are spending time with the librarians, that's the teacher's prep time. The other reason to do it is that part of the ENDS work and the curriculum work that we've been doing is we've been developing a digital literacy uh, curriculum. And that digital literacy curriculum um, is embedded in all the other work the students do with their other teachers, but the primary high level kind of components of it are delivered by the librarians to the students and they need the time to do that. Um, Braintree has always had trouble um, getting an, an academic interventionist. Um, we have one right now that's uh, a point eight, and so we just want to get them up to full time um, so that we don't lose them. Because right. academic interventionists have the full credentials of a teacher. Um, same thing like we just talked about Brookfield, we're just increasing the library to get another day um, to help, help with the planning time with the teachers and to uh, increase the ability to deliver that digital literacy Can curriculum. Can you back, back one slide? Yep. Oop. Why are those? library media point two is so different between because one of them has more seniority than the other oh. been here more years remember they go up on the pay scale so mm -hmm. so one of them's younger one of them's good eyes <laughs> randolph elementary and this the the world almost stopped in its tracks made no request this year <laughs> they're, they're usually the big big requesters so that was actually pretty impressive um ruhs um Point five for a drug and alcohol counselor. Um, this is actually moving Colin over from the tech center to the high school. Um, a couple, a couple of reasons for that. Um, as was noted when we were doing our data analysis and our teamwork um, during COVID, the incidence of alcohol and substance abuse was going up dramatically. Um, a lot of that due to the social isolation of the times, um, and so Colin has been instrumental in helping to kind of reverse that trend. Um, as 
uh, Felicia as the RTCC team is really trying to work out their budget. Um, what typically happens with other schools, um, the other sending schools, not, not, not us, is that uh, their counselors actually support their kids from their sending school. And so um, in an effort to try to help her with her budget, as well as to um, you know, follow the same model that she's through the school, Colin will still help RTC students that come from RUHS when needed. But it gets the 35000 out of her budget to help kind of modify the, the tuitions. Um, life skills program, again, this is a part of the ENDS. This is one of the ENDS um, piece. Um, we've done some initial work. Um, we've talked with the, the community. We've talked with the teachers. We had a, a small discussion with a, a group of students that were willing the other day. Um, to actually hammer out, you know, the specifics of this. Um, I've talked with Lisa and Katie, and it looks like, you know, Deb, Larry, we may be hitting up to actually start to put the programming together for this. Um, they'll need a little bit of extra money for supplies um, to get things off the ground, and a little bit of money for transportation if it, if it turns out the way that we're envisioning it. Um, Jason Finley, who is now over at RUHS, um, is looking again, prices have gone up, especially for fuel, um, a little extra money to help him with the transportation as they do the career, career exploration work and internships and whatnot. I'm going fast, interrupt me anytime you want. It's just, it's just numbers, the important stuff's at the end with what's gonna potentially happen to your taxes. So, <laughs> uh, RUHS, we talked about, so special education. Um, it was kind of, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, the number of students on IEPs is in the third year of a downward trend. So we have, able, have been able to reverse that, but that does not mean that we have not been having new students come in from out of districts a lot with high needs. Um, and so a lot of these costs have to do with that. So we need a, a, a full-time paraeducator to come in to work with one of our students or at least anticipating it for ne next year. Um, one of the big impacts of COVID, uh, again, with that social isolation, is we've seen a huge increase in terms of aggression, um, aggressive behaviors that we physically cannot accommodate um, within the building. So there will be a, a, a couple of students that will be tuitioned out potentially next year, and so we need to be able to pay for that. Um, associated with those tuition out students, we're responsible for transportation, so we'll have to pay for the rides back and forth. Um, and obviously, again, transportation costs are a little bit higher um, because, of, uh, because of the inflation and the fuel increases. Um, we've been spending more and more money on occupational uh, therapy. Um, OT, especially a lot of you that are Gifford know better, better, better than I do, but OT is, is around being able to do daily life skills. You know, you know for our kids, you know, it could be things as simple as holding a pencil properly. Um, but there's been a, a growing need in the younger population as they're coming up for OT, so we're putting money aside in anticipation of that. Um, we have had a speech-language pathologist who has historically um, been paid for by grants. Um, that's not a comfortable place for them to be um, because if the grant dries up, we lose the speech pathologist. Luckily, those grants have been, you know, fairly secure, but the appropriate thing is to move them into the regular budget, which we are doing. Um, we also have a, a student or two that are coming in um, with severe vision impairment, and so we need to buy specialized equipment to be able to allow them to access the curriculum as, as they should be allowed to. Is there one SLP for the district, or two for the... So there, there's, there's two and potentially a third, depending upon what Kayla decides to do. The third might be through, might be through the title grant, and there's a reason for it. Um, a couple of years back, we had a finding from the state that we were having a high number of students being found in need of speech and language services about three times the, the normal rate. And so we worked with the AOE to try to find the best way to, to, to fix it, to try to get us down to, you know, kind of where everybody else was. And so what was decided was kind of like what we were talking about with preschool, is that the students weren't getting the services they needed until too late, until they had actually expanded to the point where now you need a full IP, IEP to deal with it. So at that time, we had brought on through a grant, um, the ESSER money actually, 
um, to have a, a speech and language pathologist who works directly with those preschool students, identifies them early, gives them the services there while they're still regular education students so that they never advance to the, the level of um, you know, needing an IEP service. So yeah, so good questions. Um, there are I, the, the CMOs, I call these the contractual and mandatory um, increases. So these are things that we don't really have a lot of control over. You know, some stuff is discretionary. Yeah, I can choose to hire that para or not. Um, in some cases, I can choose to pay for that Carnegie Math um, program or not. But these are ones that just happen we have to pay, right? There are these salary increases uh, for the staff based upon the contract. That is set by contract. It will happen. Um, part of that number is my best estimate at where negotiations are going to land based upon the comparables that are coming in around the state. Um, so that's eight, about almost a million bucks, but 889000 Health insurance costs are going up 269000 this year um, for the district. Um, because of inflation, uh, the supplies will cost 116000 more just to keep things at the same level that they were last year to get the same, same amount of supplies. Heating costs will go up about 62000 um, The other utilities, electricity and whatnot, we're looking at an increase of 23000 And this is one that we will talk a about um, when we get to the RTCC budget. But remember that we are the main feeder for the technical center and we pay tuition for our students to go there so if their tuitions go up that impacts our local budget that impacts our orange southwest budget the one that we're talking about because we have to pay those tuitions um, I put that in blue because um, she's asked for a pretty hefty increase um, and as we go from now to the next budget we're gonna have some pretty hard talks about that um, because it's driven tuition up you'll see that a little bit later Yep. I'm just trying to get a grasp on percentage wise here. Like, for example, heating, where are we at currently? That's a $62,000 increase, correct? Yeah, it's about, it's about a 16, if I remember correctly, it's about a 16% increase. Um, health insurance overall was up about 12.7%. Um, supplies was also high ish. That was in the 14 to 16% range. Um, and the utilities was, was small. I believe that was in the 7 to 9% range in terms of the estimates on there. Um, you will get an actual, I can actually even give it to you tonight, but you're probably better off waiting until more of the formulas and things from the state are finalized. It will have all of that. This was last year. This is this year. This is sure. the increase. This is the decrease. So yeah. you'll get a financial statement that shows that well before you vote on it in, in January. Um, <laughs> all right, so the expenses. So I got that down there from the, from the old TV show, Chuck, there, right? Don't freak out. Um, so this year's budget, the, the year that we are currently sitting in, 2022-23, um, the overall budget was $22 million. Um, based upon what we just talked about, we're looking at a total increase in expenses of $2.2 million, which would bring our budget for next year to $24 million, which is about a 10% increase. The reason not to freak out is because we have significant revenues to offset most of this. Um, and so I'll show you that in about two slides. Um, one of the things to always kind of I try to point out is that in terms of these expenses, that 2.2 uh, million increase in, in our expenses for next year is what's discretionary um, and what's mandated. The orange is what we have no or little control over. The blue is what we do. So, you know, 1.9 million of that is, is completely due to contractual obligations and mandatory things that we have to pay. Um, the 274,000 is actually discretionary things that we're adding in this case to help out the ends. All right, bottom line, so this is the good stuff. So the new expenses, the expenses are going up by 2.2 million, but the new revenue that we are generating this year is 3.1 million. So the change from last year is that we will actually be asking directly from taxpayers for 901,000 less than we did last year. Um, assuming that there's no major change in CLA, um, common level of appraisal, that is information that we don't have at this point in time. It's supposed to come out on the, on the 15th, which is what, tomorrow? Um, you know, that'll help us kind of clarify things. 
Um, but if the CLA is mm -hmm. about what it was last year, and remember last year housing prices had gone up, um, it hasn't changed too much since then. It's actually predicted to start dropping like a rock, which actually makes things good for us for next year. Um, but uh, at this point in time, what folks are looking at is a five cent um, decrease per hundred dollars of assessed value on their properties. So if you've got the average home price now in uh, uh, average priced home in Vermont, which goes for three hundred and fifty eight thousand, you're looking at one hundred and eighty dollars savings on your school taxes. So again, based on the data that we have now, it will be in the ballpark, but it may not may not be exactly the same. I know. What's that? <laughs> That's a That's crazy average. average. Yeah. How many of our graduates are going to buy a house? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I couldn't in Massachusetts, and I was making a hell of a salary. And I, I saved up money for years, and I still still couldn't do it. Their, their average prices when I left were for a home that you could actually move into without doing a lot of work was probably 850000 So, yeah, it's, um, it may, makes life tough. Um, questions at all? That's the OSSD budget, and then we'll do a really quick on the, the Tech Center and then the Raven. The only one that you are actually voting on tonight is the Raven budget. <coughs> all right, so RTCC. Now, they're asking for a lot, but there's good reasons for it. Um, so what the Tech Center, again, we do three separate budgets. There's the district budget, which is the, the elementary schools, middle school, the high school. RTCC is a whole separate animal, and then we have the, the Raven program, which is a collaborative um, for students with, with, with um, a higher level of need, um, and they're, they're their own budget as well. So at RTCC, um, she's looking to bring in a, a, another math teacher and an ELA social studies teacher. And why she is doing this is it goes back to the district's ends. Um, these students need education in both of those subjects uh, to be successful, to also score well on, on um, the assessments that they're required to do to show proficiency at RTCC. Um, and right now, under the structure that they have, they have 160 kids, one English teacher who has to teach them all, and that is not a workload that any teacher should have. Typically, what you look for in a super good environment in a, in a wealthy district that can afford it in ELA, the teacher should not have more than 80 students on their workload. Uh, students outside of ELA, you know, the, the typical standard is 100 total. Um, same thing right now um, with the math teacher, right? And so she's trying to get those, those teachers in there to give the kids the, the quality education in those subject areas that they need um, to get their performance up. Um, She's also looking to take um, the part of the current ELA teacher out of Perkins. It's being, being paid for by a grant. Um, it's been in there for a while. Um, typical rule of thumb is that, you know, uh, the grantors will allow folks to, to pull for the same thing for three years. And by that time, it's either, either you've completed the mission, that person has completed their mission and should no longer be needed, or this is a long-term piece that you need and should just go into your regular budget. So I think she's anticipating that three year, um, three year kind of general rule. Um, same thing with the para for the same reason they've been in there for more than three years. So there is the possibility that they might no longer allow it to come out of the Perkins grant, allow them to come out of the Perkins grant. The dental program that was built last year um, is, was built and constructed using the time grant. And so now all that money um, and cost of that program needs to shift over to the, the regular budget. The grants are good to get things up and running and started, but after they're up and running and started, um, the, they, it has to come out of their regular budget. Um, it is self-sustaining right now. The numbers are a little lower than we had hoped, uh, but I think a lot of that was due to our original teacher quitting just before the start of the year and they were able to put something together piecemeal so that the students are getting you know three days of instruction um, each week and then doing other work um, and so I, I think that's had a drag on the program um, benefits for the administrative assistant um, the admin one of the administrative assistants that is there is retiring at the end of the year she does not take benefits and so we have to put money aside in case the, the person that replaces uh, her does. Is that full-time? 
Yeah. And so you, that, that tells you the cost of, of the benefits that we provide to the staff. Um, every staff member has access to $30,000 worth of benefits paid for by the district. Um, the nurses, um, there is a shared nurse, um, and we've been trying to increase the nursing staff. Um, some of that started with COVID, but it was needed prior to. Um, and so this is additional cost to make sure that she still has access um, to a nurse um, at the level that, that, you know, she's historically needed it over the last couple of years. Um, so her total um, in terms of additional expenses is $400,000, right, $399,100. Um, what the impact is, the impact is a lot greater on RTCC because it's a smaller budget. Right. If it were 400000 against a $24 million budget like we have, that wouldn't be a drop in the bucket. Things wouldn't shift much, but it's, it's a huge, huge difference here. So in 2022-23, the year that we're currently in, um, she was at uh, $3.1 for her budget. Um, given these things that she is looking for, she would be at $3.7 million, almost $3.8, which is an 18% increase. Tuition this year is eighteen six seventy, which is right in the middle of what the other tech centers around the state, when we took a, a, a look, um, are charging. Um, her tuition next year, if this were to go through, would be 23291 And I still, from my perspective, um, usually I would be very negative about that for some reason, and I still haven't figured out why my gut says it's okay, probably due to the, in, the cost increases of everything. Um, we also have to remember that our tech center is run differently than the other tech centers. We provide a full day. How does it compare to Green Mountain Tech Center up in that's attached to Lamoille? Because they're a yep. full day. I can actually, Robin was pulling that together. Yeah. So I'll, I'll send that to you. It's, it's going to be a little bit difficult because it's going to be this year's numbers, not what they're projecting yet for next year. Right. That's what we're waiting right. for. Mm -hmm. um, but currently, when we looked at the other tech centers, um, we're right kind of in the middle. You know, mm -hmm. some of them are here, some of them are here, we're right about Right, there. but I think it's unfair when you compare a half-day setup to a full day. And the fact that we would now have the ability for the students to take their classes in-house with fully qualified teachers mm -hmm. in an environment that's going to be a really positive one because the numbers will be, be, be respectable, right? Yeah, so I know Green Mountain doesn't, they they ship them over to Lamoille, but they do offer they you know they offer that. But I think they do have an English and a math yeah. instructor, the, and they have a very fancy building. Yeah. I was like, wow, this well, is really nice. She's also <laughs> Felicia's also getting the benefit of the fact that the numbers have increased post COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and so each year she gets a little bit more funding from the state. It's, it's based upon a three-year average. Mm -hmm. So like last year we were all grumpy because it's like, you know, we got 157 kids, but the state's only given us funding for 124. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it has an impact. She has another, if the numbers stay where they are in one more year, she will be getting the full value of the, of the, the population of her students, which she doesn't have right now. But again, I've got to I've got to do some more more thinking about it. Twenty three is high, but for some reason my gut's telling me it's not, um, and I got to understand why that is. So yeah. I just have one quick question. I know that there was some discussion maybe last year of changing the format to a half day. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like it was killed. No. Um, so we had a long discussion with um, the AOE about it. Um, their highest recommendation was leave it alone, uh, but you do need to get your math and your ELA scores up, and the way to do that is to get the additional teachers. Um, the reason that they said to leave it alone was because the state was looking at, during this coming legislative session, potentially, of revamping how um, tech centers are funded. Mm -hmm. And one of the <coughs> things that they were looking at was the data and the research um, around was it better to have the students take their, their core academics at their home school and come to the tech center for the tech? Or was it better to in, embed to bring those teachers, have those core academic teachers in the tech center? And the research was saying they're better having the teachers in the tech center. 
So to Felicia's credit, she is actually following mm -hmm. the research and, and, and the, the advice of the, of the AOE at the time. So make no major changes until we find out what happens in, in the legislature. So good question. Yeah. Um, questions on RTCC. So there, there will be some, some, some changes. I don't know what. We've got to have some discussions. This is always the first budget. I just, this is everything everybody asked for because this is what we would need to hopefully mm -hmm. achieve all, all the ends. Um, Will you float it out to the sending districts to just see if they go, oh, no. <laughs> Although so, I know they can't, they're and not what, allowed and that's, that, to that's, that's, what I, that's what I was about but, to say. They, they, but they, at the they same do it time, anyway. yeah, there's um, a, I wonder. Yeah, but, but again, the biggest impact's us, right? Because, you know, mm -hmm. yes, the 100, we, 100 and, 150 kids that are there, you know, 67 on Mirage. Right. So it's um, when it goes up. So, but uh, you know what? Again, I think I think where my intuition is leading me is that you know if we have those, if we have those additional resources there, the, those kids are going to get such a better education. It's worth it. Um, so, but again, I got I got a got a month to work work with Felicia for us to kind of really kind of plow through it. Um, the Raven budget. The Raven is our our specialty program. It is a collaborative. Um, we typically, it typically serves about 14 students um, that are fairly high needs, but in, in a special category of high needs. Um, on average, three of the students of, of those 14 are ours. The rest of them pay tuition to come in and, and take advantage of the program. Uh, I did an analysis prior to COVID on it just to see, you know, what the cost impact was to the district. Because sending these students out to other locales to receive these services would cost significantly more. Um, just on our students alone, Raven saves us about a million dollars every six to seven years um, in terms of being able to have the program and it is quite successful. Um, there's not typically a lot of change with um, Raven. Um, all the change, that 4.43% increase that you see, that is all due to just their, their step, you know, projected salary increases and, you know, almost, almost more is the uh, health insurance increases. Um, there's no other changes there. So their tuition would go from 25,241 to 26,410. Um, to get similar services in another location, probably the cheapest place would be you know, about $60,000 to have it done, and we'd have to pay for transportation on top of that. How many staff members are there? Uh, there's two. We actually, um, when we had to shut down the old building and we moved into the new building where they're at a few years back, um, we actually had the planning done to expand the size of the building to potentially expand the size of the program and serve more students um, because we were going through, and all the districts were going through the um, an influx in terms of trauma-based behaviors, which is a lot of what this program serves. So we actually had the plans draw, drawn up to be able to blow out the north wall of that building and, and expand the space. Um, we did spend a year, we put money in the budget to get another teacher there so that we could try to start increasing the enrollment. Um, we've always got the students um, for the program, but we couldn't find a teacher that fit exactly what was needed for that. And we tried for a year or two, and then we, we've given up at this point in time. I am deathly fearful um, that our two personnel that are there, um, that if they retire at some point in time, the program dies because it is that hard to find somebody who is qualified with these students. So that's, that's constantly on my mind and constantly as we were, we're doing hiring each year and seeing our special educators that are coming in, I'm constantly screening them for people that are capable or would be willing. There were, there were capable people out there, but they weren't willing to work in that program. Um, but it, it is a jewel um, of the district, uh, and they've done an incredible job. So that's it for, for budget, kind of where we are. So the reality is, is we're spending a lot more, but we've got a hell of a lot more res revenue coming in that more than compensates for it. Our overall spending, um, when you balance those two, two things out, means that our ask to the community taxpayers would be for 901000 less than, than the previous year. So we're, we seem to be in pretty good stead. Things that could tank this is if the um, legislature decides to tap some of that uh, $64 million in surplus money to the Ed Fund and use it for other purposes. So 
we should have more information on that, you know, when, when we meet in January. And as I get as I get some real final final numbers, um, that's when I pick up. I typically do three uh, community discussions about this. Um, but it's not worth doing until I can actually show them what their tax rates are going to be because that's what they're really interested in. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so I have one question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Last year, we discussed the surplus in the OSSD and what that is allocated for. Can you talk about that a little bit? So like we, we have- What it looks like for this next year. So we have a significant surplus um, that, so the surplus comes from what was not spent at the end of last year. So we have a significant surplus that is part of this budget process. We have to decide what we want to do with it. We can roll some of it over to help further subsidize next year's taxes so people don't have to pay as much. Um, we usually put some into the various reserve accounts to be used in the future. Like we usually put some in the facilities reserve account so that we have it on hand so when things happen like the heat blows up. Um, we have the money right here and there to fix it um, without having to go out to bond. Um, I think Brent actually originally built that one to make sure that there was enough money to replace the roofs, you know, every 20 years when the roofs needed to be replaced. I built a variety of other reserve funds over the course of time um, to protect us from, from deficits in areas where it was hard to predict what was going to happen in future years. I cannot give you a total dollar amount. Um, that has to come from the auditors, right? We, we have the auditors come in, they do a yearly audit, um, and that will be the official number once we receive that. It should be coming in from them any day now. Um, it is on or about a million dollars will be the surplus. So did I, did I, I gave a lot of information, Chelsea, uh, ask a little further if I missed, missed what you were, you were asking. No, I think that that um, answers my question about what the surplus will be. So you'll keep, you know, sufficient funds in those reserve funds. And then at the end of the day, there'll likely be a million dollars that we need to decide if we're going to put it in more facilities or in something else. Um, so that's good information. Is there a, you know, like Felicia has a plan for the tech center? Um, and yes, the costs are going up and, you know, it seems justified. Is there a plan like that that Katie and Lisa have come up with for the high school? In terms of which aspect? In terms of, um, you know, maybe some new programs or... Yeah, they've uh, they've built actually quite a bit. You know, the STEM program um, that we originally started has has morphed into a full robotics program in a in programming um, that's associated with it. Um, one of the big projects that they are working on now that I started with them at the beginning of the uh, school year was taking a look at their master schedule. Um, and that's, that's huge because that's the structure that guides how all learning happens within a building. And a good master schedule on its own can actually improve, improve student outcomes. So they're doing a tremendous amount of work around that right now because that takes an awful lot of buy-in um, from students, from the community members, from the teachers, and from the union. Um, and so hopefully that will be up, the new schedule will be up and running in place um, next year. Um, there's other things I drawn a blank right now just at the end of a long meeting, but there has been significant work that they, they've been engaged in. The Carnegie Math um, is uh, primarily geared towards grades 6 to 12, um, so that is within their program. Um, one of the ELA uh, new programs, that is geared towards 6 to 12 as well. Um, so they've got that work going on in those parts of the ends. They will have the life skills program, um, hopefully that is in and up and running next year as, as we complete that work. So they, they do have a significant amount that's going on. Um, Heather's got some equity work that's going on um, that's directly affecting uh, the school that she's working in tandem with Katie and Lisa. So. 
Yeah, like a lot of the vision work isn't hitting the budget, but it's things like adding an expectation that all students participate in a science fair in grade nine, um, things like that. So it's not having a, a you're not seeing it here in this presentation, but um, I think it would be really great to invite them to come to do a presentation, a short report to the board. Yeah, they're, they're working. We've had uh, pretty good discussions um, on bringing in an AP music theory. Um, but one of the problems that we, we had in kind of getting it off the ground is the current master schedule that they have is actually restricting kids from being able to take music um, and take band, and that's one of the reasons, other reasons to change it. But, you know, AP Music Theory is, is an incredible course um, because the AP courses are kind of ranked. Some of them are much more prestigious than others. At the high end, you've got the AP Physics Calc, um, the Calculus A, B, and B, C, and right up there with it is AP Music Theory. You know, at the lower end, you've got the Environmental Science and Biology, um, but that is a pretty prestigious course and, and, and takes quite a bit of skill um, and intellectual capacity for the students to do well in it. And so that is something that's also kind of on the slate in the discussion. But we're going to have to get the uh, we're going to have to get the master schedule straightened out before we can actually support that fully. Plus, the teacher um, the teacher is interested in teaching it um, has to go off to the training in St. Johnsbury. Um, they have to go through what's called their audit. They have to develop the full curriculum and have the AP organization actually approve it for use. Um, so yeah, so good questions. That would be awesome. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I, le I learned a lot I went back when I was a principal doing observations on teachers teaching that class. It was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So. Other questions? How far over did I go? Uh, <laughs> oh, was it? No. <laughs> 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 My sense of time, I <laughs> was fine to me, but. <laughs> yeah. 13 minutes of your time. Okay, so 7.33. I need, I need someone to be a kind of like a timer person. Because <laughs> for me, I'm just absorbed in the, in the presentation I and I have no sense of how much time has gone by. Um, all right, well, our next thing, um, policy 4.5. Um, so again, Sam, you're kind of new at this. So we had um, a training last spring, and one of the results of that was um, uh, the trainer recommended that we look at the policies that, so we monitor Blaine with the uh, executive limitations and our ends policies the other policies so the the governance process policies are our policies and so this is kind of a way for us to monitor our own our own behavior and whether or not we're doing things um, according to our policies so um, everyone should have gotten um, the next policy that we're going to be doing for the january meeting is the committee principles policy so you should all have a blank one remember you wanted to get those ahead of time just so you had a whole full month to to do those um, as i was doing this 4.5 um i found that um it hasn't come up a lot because <laughs> um, this is the conflict of of um a lot of it is the conflict of interest. Um, so anyway, um, I'm curious as other folks um, sort of reviewed our, our board behavior in light of this policy, um, I, found, I found like the first two parts of the policy, you know, we were, we were I think we're doing a good job. Um, I think we've been speaking with one voice um, as a board. Um, I think all of us have been very conscious of open meeting law and not having conversations about board business over email or in person outside of a board meeting. Um, I don't know if other folks have, tell me if I'm wrong. 
<laughs> I guess. Um, has anyone observed anything where we're maybe falling short on that? On that piece? Okay. Um, and then um, members must demonstrate loyalty to ownership, unconflicted by loyalties to staff, other organizations, or any personal interests or as parents or guardians. Um, I feel like we've been, we've done that very well. I, I would say I've heard from all board members um, really wanting to reach out and connect with the, with the community, with the ownership, um, and sort of uh, going along with the idea of pushing our, ourselves as the board to go out there and do that, and, and we are we are finally doing it. It's, we're making it happen um, with the portrait of the graduate. Um, what do other people think in terms of that one? Um, I haven't seen a lot of people say, "Wait," you know. They're not. They're not sort of thinking. They're thinking K twelve. They're not thinking my children, um, which is um, what we are we're charged to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I think putting always is, I mean, we're human, right? Right, so, right. So, of course, we're, many of us are thinking as parents, so to put always, a little bit of a lie, but because we're human. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, the conflict of interest stuff, I put as not applicable just because I, we, we haven't had any conflict of interest issue come up with any board member as far as I'm aware. Um, so I just put NA that nothing has arisen. Um, and then, um, uh, let's see, number four on the very last page. <clears throat> board members will respect the confiden confidentiality appropriate to issues of a sensitive nature. Um, again, you know, I I feel like our board does a good job of, of keeping executive session information in, in executive session. Um, I haven't haven't been hearing things um, out in the community and there hasn't been anybody, you know, rogue going out to the press or anything like that. Um, board members will be properly prepared for board deliberation. You know, we had a couple of, you know, quasi-judicial board things that came. I felt like everyone was pretty well prepared for those and asking um, good questions. So, and anyone else have other <laughs> uh, other uh, responses to those? And I think it's helping us be more properly prepared with this kind of exercise. Mm -hmm. That we're given something very specific to do for the next meeting to prepare, rather than simply reading through the materials that we'll be discussing. We have to actively engage in something in order to prepare for the next meeting. So mm -hmm. this exercise is a good one. And then number six, board members will support the legitimacy and authority of final determination of, bo of the board on any matter, irrespective of the board member's personal position on the issue. I think I, I, I would say we've done a good job of that. It seems to me that in our discussions a lot of times, we end up coming around almost to a consensus. A few times there's been um, someone who's maybe not in agreement, but I haven't seen, at least in my experience, anyone feeling, um, you know, that they can't go along with, with the majority vote of the board. Um, so I think we've done that really well. Um, so when I came to the end, I was like, I don't really see anything in this particular policy that I feel like we need to work on. But I don't know if anyone else has a different uh, viewpoint on this policy. 
So then I just said, we'll take a look again next year because maybe some conflict of interest will show up <laughs> or something. Um, and yeah, we may need to. Yeah, 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 we'll have to keep Sam in line. <laughs> 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 All right. So I think we made up some time with that. Um, and I am I'm sort of keeping these. Linda sort of jots down quick notes. I know I was speaking kind of fast with that one, but we do usually have some kind of summary of uh, if there was anything big that came up as we were reviewing it. Um, so next up, uh, we have required state policies. So again, remember that as um, the way our board governs, um, we have delegated to Lane to make sure that we have all of the state policies that are necessary um, according to state law um, uh, in our district and, and um, you know, read through by us and approved by us and in our, uh, on our website um, for uh, district policies. So he went through, and I'm going to let you sort of. Yeah, there are some bit. new ones that the state is requiring. So the one of the things to just point out is that if, if folks remember that the website had gotten taken down when it was hacked, one of the things that the hackers were doing was they were anywhere where we had linked something or put something in onto the website, like the policies, they had pulled those down and put pictures and comments, which we won't go into, up, up in their place. So as part of this work, I was actually scanning through the, the website. Um, there are policies that we have that were removed and need to be put back up, and it's a quite extensive job, so I'm working with Ben to get that done. Um, during the same time, um, you know, usually quarterly, I kind of go through and do a scan and see kind of what's changed and what else needs to be added. So I believe there's either eight or nine of these now. Um, all of them we currently have um, in one form or another. Um, and so you'll see in the notes on those where it says cleaner language. So in other words, we already have these policies in place, but the um, VSBA pulls a, a group of legal folks together, usually from Pietro's firm, and kind of refines it um, if there's been any changes. So cleaner language just, just means just that. The big new one um, is, uh, comes from the, uh, the school mascot and branding law. And so we are required to have that policy. So this is the model policy from the state when it came out. Um, to talk about. The other one that's on here is this fund balance policy. That is not a required uh, mandate. All the others are required uh, or mandated policy. Um, this has been a recommendation um, from the auditors in the last audit. It was not a finding or anything like that. It's like a, it would be nice if you. Mm -hmm. And so we, we are accommodating um, that. I, I worked with Robin. It's a fairly complex purpose, um, what it basically has you do is uh, categorize your funds. Like if you look at the financial statement, you know it'll say transportation, that's a fund. And there's a bunch of little lines that roll up into it. You categorize the funds um, as to whether or not they can be used if there is a deficit. So in other words, if it looks like we're going to be in the red at the end of the year, and I need to compensate for that because under the law we're not allowed to be in a deficit, what funds am I allowed to pull money from to cover that deficit? And so that's kind of what it does. Um, it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's the basic gist. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that is in there for review. And again, it's just based on the, our auditor's uh, recommendation. Mm -hmm. Since we paid them all that money, it seems wise to listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And these, um, this is the first reading, so um, at the next meeting, we will be approving those, those policies. Are there any questions about any of them? And again, you have, if you've got any questions, we've got a, we've got a month to sort of look at them if you have any questions. Um, but again, those are, we've, we've delegated Lane to make sure we're in order with all of those. So it's really his lane, not ours. We're, we're just making sure he's abiding by state law. Um, so next up is um, 
we had tabled this, and oh, now it feels funny. like a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, Heather and I were at the VSBA conference, mm -hmm. and I can't even. It was even... on October 20th and October 21st. Right. And um, it was in I... accordance with your policy on providing collaborative learning opportunities for board members and district leadership. Mm -hmm. The title and focus of the conference was How Are the Students Doing? And the keynote address was from Kay Douglas, um, and she's with the Texas Association of School Boards. She had a really great perspective being from Texas and dealing with the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues there. Um, and she really emphasized the importance of student voice. Uh, there were a series of workshops provided on Thursday and another series of workshops provided on Friday, and I attended both days. The topics um, were shared with you. Um, from, by Anne and are still available online at the Vermont Vermont School Board Association org do backslash conference right they're still all there mm -hmm. yep. and each of them the slides and the content are, are it's really robust I mean if you have the time to go through some of them they're they're, they're quite engaging topics included um, improving student achievement um, through increasing student voice um, and how sc school leaders can overcome educational inequities, using data literacy to boost school board knowledge and oversight, um, the school board's role in district culture and climate. And um, so I don't want to read all the titles to you. Anne did email them to you, and we can resend that to you again for your review. But I, I do want to say it was time well spent, and they also went over some of these model policies and mm -hmm. state required policies with us, and specifically uh, Act One, uh, which is coming, which is huge, and has to do with equity, equity and inclusion, and how um, mm -hmm. the state is going to be guiding curriculum changes and other expectations of school districts to make sure um, that all of our youth are are safe and included in schools. So it was very informative, and I, I we attended different sessions. Right, so we tried to maximize, because uh -huh. she was interested in some, and, and I was interested in others. Um, so, and one of the ones that I went to was on the uh, comprehensive assessment system, so it was getting a look at, sort of from the portrait of a graduate, all the different testing that the state um, is required requiring, well, some of it is required, but some of it is um, the AOE provides um, provides help to districts to help them find and refine their local assessments um, so that so that they are working toward achieving those portrait graduate ends. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, I also found it, I went to another one that the VSBA folks put on, and that was all about doing things like codifying your procedures, and, and I was like, oh, great, <laughs> we're actually doing something that, they're, that they um, really um, are trying to get boards to do um, so that uh, you can, you know, so that you can run run your meetings well, and you can stay focused on what you really need to do. And then the other one that I went on went to um, was related to Kay's um, presentation, and that was just again sort of really even the National School Boards Association really trying to get board members to think in a systemic way. You know, we're systems thinkers. We're looking at a complete system um, and to try not to get bogged down in, in deta operational details, which um, when you listen to some other districts, and, and especially she had stories of being in Texas, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. where boards are, are meddling into things rather than looking at syst the system as a whole. Um, uh, so that was really... I felt it made me feel like we were um, headed in the right direction in terms of uh, the way we're operating. So, um, but always really interesting to sit down with other. There are other board members um, from other districts, and I did go to one other presentation, and and the chair of the the Dresden School District. So that's a 
New Hampshire, Vermont, it's Hanover High School's uh, district. They were having some some difficult meetings and uh, some people going through and making, you know, they had to dismiss somebody from a meeting and then they didn't escort them out of the building and so they were taking TikTok, made a TikTok of all these different things that were on the walls as they were going out of the school and just, you know, just for harassing the board a little bit. So made it made me feel a little bit better about some of the stuff that's been happening up here. but. Anyway, it was, I, would, I would strongly recommend, um, you know, if you have that time in October, it's always in October. Um, I actually had said to them, well, you know, we may have a really nice conference center up in Randolph, so right in the middle of the state, that maybe they should um, use that venue, so we'll see what happens. But. Nice for you. <laughs> <laughs> but make it a lot easier than mm -hmm. having to go over it. Lake Maury is really beautiful, but I don't know. There was the one downstairs section. It was like sewage smelling, and I was like, ah. That's right. I, I grew up in Bradford, and a couple of my friends used to. Yeah, I waited tables at the other resort. It was at the other end of the lake, but it's been around a long time, and it <laughs> looks about the same. <laughs> when I was a kid, so anyway, but it was a really great. I love that they brought students in. They brought students yeah. in to talk about the importance of youth in partnership with uh, district governance, with school board district governance, and the students were so enthusiastic about the work. It made, it made me wish that we had already had it built, right? Um, and so they gave us tips on how to do it. It was really... That was, the, mm -hmm. to me, that was, the, the, all, the, all the sessions were great, but when the, the high school students saying, oh yeah, we contribute to our school board, we bring them reports that we write with our principal, I just, I was like, I want to build that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, we've been in talks with Katie and Lisa and start, sort of hoping to, at some point, bring you some student voice here. That's it. Let's move on to the next thing. Okay. Uh, so moving along, we have uh, the meeting with the legislators. We usually do that in February, and we didn't do it the two years of COVID. But um, Kacho is particularly interested in doing it, and um, so she's going to kind of lead this uh discussion about sort of um I don't, I'm not particularly interested in the, I mean I think the thing that I was most concerned about maybe just being the constituent one of the constituents from Braintree is that we have new representation um and so this year um because Braintree was pulled out um of the district for Orange County and we're now in with Washington County which is a <clears throat> puts us in an interesting position just because we have now three new legislators who are not familiar mm -hmm. um, with Braintree. Mm -hmm. And so I was basically just advocating to have this legislative meeting this year, inviting these legislators to come so that we are kind of like a, hey, we're here, we're Braintree, you represent us now, so let's just remember that. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and give them a good chance to kind of meet this district, um, meet the school board, um, and then just start having us be kind of a, a little bit of a bird in their ears, like knowing that we're down here. So that was my only kind of um, reasoning for thinking that this would be a good idea to have this again this year. And obviously we've had a few years, I think, where we now haven't had our legislators coming to see us. So just a good chance to kind of re reconnect with them um, and invite some new ones in. So I didn't really have a lot for this other than just saying I think it's a good idea. Yeah, sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, agree. and how can we um, facilitate that? Well, we would just invite them to um, have a certain amount of time to come to our next board meeting in February. Okay. So we would actually just during our advocacy, that would be, um, you know, legislators, like a visit from legislators. And they usually come and just present on kind of the, the topics that are of interest in, edu in education in Montpelier right now um, and introduce themselves and some of the policies that are kind of coming on the table. Well, and we do have that, they have that surplus they've got to decide 
what they're going to do. We got more power now. <laughs> yeah. Another yeah. couple legislators up there. Right. Right. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out if that 64 million is due to leftover grant money from ESSER or if it actually came from tax revenues, because that has implications for the following year, right? Because the grants will be gone. So, so that would be a good question to ask, right? <laughs> when they yeah. come. Um, so, what does that look like? Like the three from Washington County. Is there three in Washington County, and then also our representatives, or it would look? It has looked in the past as our um, representatives uh, and our uh, senator. So we share representatives, right? But we don't share senators. Senate. Mm -hmm. So Correct. it would be the same representatives, but a different, but uh, Mark Two, McDonald, so. and then three from Washington. And I don't know if all three would show. You, they have three senators? We have three yeah. now. Yeah. Oh. Three heavy hitting yeah. senators. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. So it would be, um, I think last time we, you know, it would, as opposed to three people coming, we would have now more than we would have five. If they all came. If they all came. If they all came, yeah. Six. Um, right, math? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it would just be a, you know, I think it would just be a really good chance for those, I mean, again, selfishly, for those individuals to, to come visit the district because mm -hmm. they have never been here before. And that's reminding me the other big issue that I think we need to sort of put a little pressure on them about is our high school and the whole testing for what is it PFOA PCBs. 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 <laughs> I keep getting that mixed up. Um, yeah. And, and putting money aside in a in a building school building authority fund so that you know there's matching funds of some sort if people need to renovate or. Right, Renew right. Or rebuild. Because if you all remember, our high school is in the worst shape when they when they were kind of assessing well, well, without well, without well, really looking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So who typically sends the invitation? And well, yeah. when? Um, I think, I think we, it should come from the chair. The chair. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think it should just be a, 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 a simple email going out saying, you know, we, we would we, we'd like to invite you to, to the, next the February. Yeah. And maybe give them a little bit of like, Purpose. you'll have 10 minutes right. to, we'll have 10 minutes to speak kind to of thing. Speak, tell us We're going to make you wait till the end, by the way. <laughs> right. They used to do like a little open, open question answer session I, for a couple of minutes, but it wasn't, right. it wasn't long. I think it would be nice to have it. Um, if we can move it to after public comment as being the first thing, so that if we do have yes, public here, yes, we have yes. our representatives here as well, mm -hmm. um, and they're hearing public comment as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Great idea. So we'll do the February meeting. Um, I can send out the invites. If you can just let me know who your senators are, or I suppose look I can up. look it up. Yeah, we can look them up. And um. Andy and Ann. And Cummings, Andy Perchlick, and uh, and uh, it'll come to me. Okay, I can look. I can look them up too. Um, so we'll do the February meeting after public comment. After public comment, and, and we'll Watson. be talking about Watson. that. Um, So, and do we, we want to set it up with um, just a 10 minute or maybe a five minute, tell us what committees you're on, tell us um, kind of what your, I don't know, do we? Five minutes each. Yeah, five minutes each. If we've got, if all of them showed up. I know, but an invitation to um, and then, but then a question and answer period. Yeah. No, it would not be just for the board members. No, we for, it, or for public, public as well. Mm -hmm. as oh, well. The, the question section? Yeah. Uh, in, the, would, in the past, it was the public was it Was it open to the public? Yeah. Okay. They, they, were, they were well behaved in the past. Yeah. And we would keep it at three minutes. <laughs> would it for question and for answer person. per person or? 
I, I think mean, you I, would need to be a maybe monitor. I'm not looking at our big at our, our big schedule, but what typically I mean I feel like that has typically I can, been I can kind look of a focus and see. of the February meeting, so we know that there's usually more time set aside for that. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I think it was at least forty five to an hour. And you used to have Jeff Francis come. He yeah, he's a real yes. talker though. Yes. Yes. So depending on who 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 re replies and if I can if I can ask ahead of time, like maybe even get it out before the holidays, at least the first invite, they can get it on their calendar. Um, although when did they don't? They start what the end of January? No. Or is it the first week in January? First week in January. First week in January. So, yeah. So if I so if I even hit them up, or maybe I hit them up the first week in January, or or maybe I hit them before the holidays, first week in January. Yeah, maybe and then, before they get yeah in, before they get their real Wednesday. roles. Right. So, right. Second can't hit them up then. Second Wednesday. No, because it's it's a it's always a it's oh, yeah. scheduled, yeah. Yeah. Can, um, and it's typically also because of town meeting coming up the next month. Mm, I guess. Right. Touch base with you yeah. at the next meeting about. Yeah, because usually in say. February we just have a little bit of budget information, but that's going to be rolling right along. Um, uh, are we going to be on a second? We're just going to be on a review of, a, of some monitoring reports and then meet the legislators. So that's, that's sort of the, the gist of the meeting. So it yeah. sounds like you'll send an invite out to them, at least a first invite to say this is the yeah. date of the meeting. We'd like to have you, with, you know, appreciate yeah. your attendance. And then after next meeting, we, once we know, we can also send out a second reminder. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aim that for before the holidays. What? Yeah. Great. Well, I think February meeting falls like maybe the ninth. Or it's pretty eighth. early. In the uh, month. It's, it's the eighth. eighth. It's the eighth. We have an RTC. Yeah. Uh, it's the eighth. Yeah. So yeah, for those mm -hmm. folks who do the RTCs, are you the you're the rep? Can you the rep? Uh, you're the rep. Oh, you two are the reps. Okay. <laughs> Spring stats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, and are we okay with with um, with me saying you get about five minutes? I, you could, I think you can say like a brief introduction yeah. of yourself. A brief introduction. You know. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, they're gonna rather field questions than yeah than talk about do a stump speech. Yeah. He's not. He's, He's, not He's not a legislator. Oh, okay. He's with the VSBA. He's the, the first board meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah he's the political true. guy. Yeah, yeah. Who, I, I don't know if we need to invite him then. No, I, <laughs> no, no. I, I would say we'd probably be okay. Um, I think just legislators. Okay, and then Q and A. Okay, perfect. That gives me enough to Set agenda. To We're two minutes. We're back to two minutes. Run Let's go. to run run with that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Unless there are any other questions. I think that's okay. why we're doing that. All right. So we're so we're on schedule. Oh. Um so good. So we're we're and it's the February meeting. Okay. So do we need a movement to approve minutes from last? Uh so I I'm gonna have us do Sounds like we should pull out Wrapping the Raven budget in here, or was it best to pull that out as a separate vote? Um, I think it can. I think it can be. We've we've already gone through it. I think unless there's, if there's someone who wants to make a motion to pull that out separately, otherwise we I can. To approve the consent agenda. Okay. Do we second. have a second? Seconded by Hannah. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. All right, so that was passed. Um, and then Lane, you sort of gave us an update on <laughs> unions. It's, it hasn't so I was, been- So I was going back and checking the, uh, 
ground rules in terms of what could be shared publicly. Um, okay. Basically, I would, the comment that I remember is as long as it's being talked about with people who have a legitimate need to know what you would. So there's support staff. Uh, the support staff uh, negotiations are currently at impasse. Um, we worked with them. We made a couple of off offers. The district did not feel that they were making any counter offers, and there was no motion that was official. Um, they did state that you know they would move in terms of um, their second year um, ask for salary increase, um, but never actually made anything official. So at that point in time, it was it's in pass. Right now, those of you I sent out an email that are on the the support staff committee. They're looking for was it the 25th of January mm -hmm. um, to do the mediation session. Um, the teachers um, we had some tenant, a tentative agreement um, that was in place. We had another tentative agreement that was in place, but required um, folks to do some typing up of the document so that it could be signed at the next meeting. We came into the next meeting, they refused to uh, honor. Um, so we had some words about that. Um, we tried to uh, have a tentative agreement on another uh, issue. Um, they came back and said, well, we have to pass this by Stuart before we can, you know, TA on that. And we pointed out the fact that the ground rules required that you have everybody at the meeting who can sign off on TAs immediately when they're conducted. So we felt it was a violation of the ground rules. Um, they did not do some moving on their initial salary um, request, um, but it wasn't enough considering where they were starting from. Um, and so we kind of basically said, look, you know, if there's not significant movement here, we're probably going to be at an impasse pretty quickly. So that's kind of where, where we sit. Um, so and the next meeting is? Uh, there every... We, we booked it for January. Depends on which one is. So the, the support staff meetings, what was happening originally is they, they were meeting, you know, one this week, one the next week, and they were alternating. Mm -hmm. Support staff will be whenever the mediation is. Um, it was 20, it was 3rd of January, wasn't it? Was the, the next one for the teachers. The teacher. Teachers is, yeah. is January 3rd. Yeah. Okay. Right number off the top of my head. Yep, it's there. When my ADHD has come down at night, I remember things really well. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So we're moving on then, unless anyone has any other questions. Uh, so we have the reports from the principals and the superintendent. Um, financial report. Anything? Um, actually. There that just a, just more of a couple of comments as I was looking mm -hmm. through it and some things were kind of kind of jumping out a little bit um, so on the the revenue page let me sure I get something on the revenue page there's a lot of negative numbers on the balance side um, what that means is that we're just waiting for reimbursements um, a lot of these are, are grants and, and other things where we actually have to pay it up front and so we, we go into the negative and then it comes positive again when, you know, the reimbursements come in. The reimbursements usually come in monthly to quarter um, from most of these folks. So these are all actually in, in very good stead. Uh, da -da, central office, that wasn't the one. A couple of notes I've written. Uh, general liability insurance, um, we actually is ending up costing us a little bit more than we planned for. Um, it won't cause any deficits or anything like that, but that particular line is a little bit overspent. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, when you have insurance claims, like the water bursts that we had at RTCC <laughs> yeah. this year, typically your insurance goes up. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, that's the, the, the piece um, for that. You will see most likely under maintenance, um, that some of their lines are have been significantly spent, like repairs and maintenance. There's only 10% of it left for the remainder of the year. Um, since we're you know five twelfths of the way through the year, it should be you know about 40 to 50% that's left in there right now. Actually, 50 to 60% that's left in there right now. The reason it's not is because how the um, reserve funds that we request from you work. 
Um, you actually grant us the use of those funds, but we actually do not take them unless we absolutely need them. So we wait until the end of the year, and if there is a muff, enough money left over to cover all that from our regular budget, we never touch those reserve funds. Um, and so that, that one will be negative for a while because we've paid all the, a lot of the repairs and stuff out of that at this point in time. Um, so that's, that's in good shape. So just more of the logistics behind the, how things work, but things, things are good. Excellent. Yeah. Robin had no concerns. I always ask for that specific question to the, the day before the board meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're to the recap. I'm going to be reaching out to the legislators for our February meeting. Um, I think we, we are going to be looking forward to uh, s at least Google starting a, a portrait of a graduate committee meeting um, to coordinate again with Heather as we approach the hopefully first week of February community gathering. Um, anything else that I'm forgetting? Uh, just re remember to um, look over those monitoring reports. Uh, remember that is our way of holding our superintendent accountable. So you want to make sure that you understand what those reports are saying. Um, and that's it. So I don't believe we need any executive session. Um, so I need a motion to adjourn. A moved by Katya. Do I have a second? Seconded by Megan. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. 813.